What is that? I've got Mick Mars's guitar. Or Bob Deal, whatever. Or at least the one that was in the movie. <laughs> ah! So, I know people probably ask, why does he have so many flipping Epiphones? <laughs> Go look up, there's an interview with Les Paul. Les Paul. He worked and worked and worked with Gibson, and they came up with this giant piece of junk that he could not stand. He, it was hard for him to play. He didn't like it. And his Gibson grew Epiphone. They took in. They brought in Epiphone. Epiphone made uh, their necks are thinner, faster. Every time Les Paul would play, he preferred an Epiphone. Also, the Beatles. Les Paul and the Beatles played Epiphones when they were recording. And rarely, you know, even the Beatles played Epiphones and what's the other one? Gretsch or Rickenbacker. Gibsons were just, you know, when they finally caught on in like the late 60s, the 70s, you know, they thought they were big stuff and everybody wanted them, you know. Mick was playing his 80, 72 Custom, and this is a, I don't know, a, a 90s, let me see. Da, 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 da. Ooh, really? So this is like a 2006 uh, standard. Yeah. Which is not, but you know what, it's a black Les Paul with a friggin' Uh, DiMarzio uh, Super Distortion so that you're done it really doesn't matter I swear to you I've done this I've got it I've got, I put I've done this whole thing you know with uh, putting dumping one of these into a Les Paul Custom and it sounded good it sounded alright but I hate the necks then I found out that the if you get good Epiphones, and most of them are good, you can just grab an Epiphone, it's, it plays pretty good. You do some work, set it up, and it's great. Just Gibsons are a very hit and miss guitar. In my opinion, this is just me. So, I had this done. The guy uh, set it up, went all through it, put that pickup in, ripped out the... Uh, GFS, I'm not into it. That's a GFS. He, that's keeping, I'm keeping that. And this is correct as far as uh, later, the later uh, Les Paul that he was playing once they were doing Shout of the Devil Tour. Uh, you'll see that he'd taken off the tape, which I was going to put on this. I don't know. Should I put the yellow diamond tape here? Because that would look kind of cool, but it's a lot of work. I've tried it. That is not an easy thing to do. I mean, this, the lines that Nikki always put on, easy. That diamond thing, and right here, it was just weird, but it made it was mix. And I actually made a little pin with tape on it, and he wanted it really bad. And I'm like, dude, I only have one. He's like, yeah, but that's my guitar. We're arguing backstage at, the, at Santa Monica Civic in like 81, 82. Like the first time they played. The first time they played, I think that's the time they brought funny cars onto the stage. You know, drag racing cars. <laughs> it's like, what? And everybody thought they were going to start them, and they were, but they didn't. But they played with funny cars on And I don't know why there's no pictures of that show. It was, I think it was the first show, and it was packed. Because they were selling out, you know, the Troubadour and the whiskey multiple nights it's not like just selling out the whiskey anybody could do that you know my band did it no big thing gazaris all those those are little clubs 
selling out the country club in Reseda, that's a big deal. So when you can sell that out, and then Perkins Palace, and uh, they played Glendale Civic Auditorium, I got a box full of flyers still for that, because that was like a two-week notice. What? And I brought them to school, and I gave them to everybody. I passed them out. I hung them up all over Burbank and Glendale, and a ton of people showed up. And my mom stayed and watched that one. Crazy. She liked them. And that was their first, like, devil stuff where they had pentagrams and skulls. And uh, I think they had the uh, the nun on in front of the, you know, that they chopped her head off. All that stuff. They chopped off Wendy and William's head with a... You know, during PC reaction with a uh, saw, uh, chainsaw. Cool stuff that they just abandoned. And then they just went into this boring, this is me. So, Too Fast for Love, cool. It's all street, you know, it's, you know, Nikki's writing poppy songs, but mixed, making them heavy and cool. And Vince is just Vince, and Tommy's a good drummer. And then Shout of the Devil comes out, and you think, all right, this new Alice Cooper kiss, you know, this is it. We've got somebody else to take it on, and this is what they're going to be. And then we go to Theater of Pain, which was supposed to be not entertainment and death, entertainment or death. That was going to always be a live album. It was going to be TV and violence. I don't know why or how that got mixed up in history but I know I I can find an interview in BAM or somewhere where he said the next album is going to be called TV and Violence and then he was so whacked out on smack that they put out this crappy theater of pain but I went and saw them they sold out three nights at the forum uh for theater of pain they did not play the forum until you know headline the forum until theater of pain but they sold out everywhere else you know that you could possibly play so anyways when i get my guys to set it up he i say you know i tune in i tune it down a whole step da 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 in one and air and out the other because he's so so used to setting guitars up exactly how they should be blah 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 he also he does a lot of work for joe bonamacha and uh other guys so you know he just always gives them back to me it's standard tuning and to me guitars are very sensitive even this so if i just tune it down immediately the neck's gonna and the strings won't stay in tune so i'm not gonna touch it it's it's right now it's
I saying? <laughs> I just started playing. I'm like, damn, this thing's set up good. I'm not used to it, but it's like a different guitar. This thing is badass. And I cleared out all the effects. I'm back to my standard four. Wild overdrive, you know, I got the chorus going. I figured out what was wrong with it. It was just a knob had broken. And I had turned it, and it actually, I turned all one of the knobs, I turned all the way. So I thought it was, you know, it was like it was, there's a tone thing. There's a highs and lows on the chorus. I had the low and the high turned all the way off. That's what was making it sound like crap. So now I have it closer. It's, it's better now. Uh, that's probably more like it. But that's a very, it's a very big sound. I mean, if you notice, I haven't been playing with that, uh, that black label chorus, which gives it that Rhodes, you know. Because everybody argues, is he... You know, on the first album, yes, they did do the miking where the mic was catching it like a half second. And you beep, beep. So that gave it that chorusy sound, but a big sound. And also, he did multiple tracks. Randy Rose we're talking about. First album. And then on the tour, first tour, it was kind of, he was running a dry and a wet Marshall. So the effects were going to one, and the other one was dry. But they were both running, but when he'd kick on an effect, it would usually go into one amp. And then he had three marshals. And I think, it, yeah, at one point he had two on the stage when they had the stupid diary thing. And he had one stack at, on the side where actually, you know, uh, Brad Gillis just kept his whole stack there on the side. Or on this side of the stage, if you're just standing up there. And... I'm Randy. So anyways, he would run, I think, one dry and two wet or something like that. I can't remember right now, but this thing does the job. I'm running two amps. I always run two amps now because I've always done it since I, the first time I did it, actually, a friend just came to one of my shows with an amp. He's like, look at, I got this head. <laughs> 